Um, thank you everyone for joining us for this round table discussion, Burned Out Stories of Compassion Fatigue. Um, I just wanna make note that we have two chat options here today, one on the right hand screen um, and then one in the blue bar below the video. Um, so to best organize the questions uh, for the discussion leaders, um, we'd like to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, um, but we will be monitoring both chats uh, for your questions and comments. Um, so please uh, participate in the session uh, by sharing thoughts, uh, posting links, resources, and asking your questions. We really wanna hear from you. Um, if you are asking a question, we'll ask um, that you please put a question mark um, at the beginning of the question, and that makes it easy for us to sort of keep track um, and make sure that we get to those questions um, first and foremost. Um, so with that, I'd love to pass the mic over to our wonderful presenters and facilitators today, uh, Patrice and Whitney. So uh, off to you. So thank you for joining us today for our session on Burned Out, Stories of Compassion Fatigue. Uh, I'm Patrice Trisavia Presco. I'm currently the Associate Director at Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'm thrilled to be co-presenting on this with Whitney Kilgore, who's co-founder and Chief Academic Officer at iDesign. And we will um, go over the agenda for the day, or for the day, for the hour. <laughs> Um, but first, um, I'm going to turn it over to Whitney to check in with you on how you're feeling today. Yeah, we just want to find out how you're doing. You're about halfway through and there's nothing like the session just after lunch. Uh, let us know how you're doing by entering the number of the critter face that most uh, you most identify with in the chat. It'll be good to see where everybody's at after lunch. Oh, I see a couple fives. Somebody's caffeinated. Five. <laughs> uh, I think we actually now have four or five fives. So uh, coffee for lunch must have been a thing. Yeah. Or people are just wide-eyed with all the new information they're taking in. That could be <laughs> it too. Awesome. Well, we're really glad you're here. And I'm really grateful to WCET for um, including us in today's event and, and to Rachel for helping us moderate and um, monitoring double chats while we're full screen uh, trying to share some information with you today. And this is going to be a really interactive session. Um, we took a look at um, what we wanted to be able to do today. So we wanna share some stories uh, about the interviews that Patrice and I conducted uh, when we wrote the article that was featured in Educause Review during the pandemic, and, and then take a little time to do a mindfulness activity together. A uh, little lesson learned from Leah Sharan Davis. If you don't know her, I think she's here. Thank you so much, Leah, for teaching me a lot about mindfulness and, and just the power of the breath. And then we'll step into a mad tea party. And it's just a little warm up exercise, a chance for people to get to know each other in breakout rooms a little bit. And then we'll skip over to a uh, whole group uh, Q&A opportunity in Google Docs, where we'll get a chance to share some stories with each other before we wrap up and close out the day. So just a few norms. So we really want to make sure that everybody has a chance to participate fully. And um, the folks at WCET, like I said, Rachel's going to be monitoring the chat on both FeedLoop and here in Zoom. So if you'll turn off your microphone, but also turn off all those dings and notifications that might distract you so that you can be centered and present in this moment we have together. And of course, make sure your volume's turned up. You can hear us okay. Um, if you'd like to have your camera on and be present visually, of course you can do that. Um, if you prefer privacy, that's cool too. And um, stop us at any time, ask questions at any time. We've asked Rachel to actually just interrupt, you know, take, <laughs> take the microphone and tell us what questions may be coming up in the chat that seem um, important in the moment. And of course, any remaining questions after the session, Patrice and I are happy to answer via email. And then one of the things we're going to be doing today is we're going to be sharing in a Google Doc where you'll all be entering that document as anonymous and you'll be sharing stories of potentially burnout and compassion fatigue 
things that leadership may or may not have done to support instructional designers in the field, what you might be able to do or learn from each other. And so the confidentiality of what's shared there is really important. We want it to be a safe space for everybody to share, which is why we've chosen to keep it anonymous. And I would just ask that um, what gets what gets left in that Google Doc not be tagged to your name unless you wish to have your name associated with it, in which case you'd actually need to write that in parentheses next to your, your lessons learned that you're sharing. And then we do want everybody to assume the best intent, to listen, to be understood, and to understand, and to be compassionate in this moment. The conversation we're having today really demands compassionate uh, behavior. So one of the things we want you to question at different points during this session is why are you talking and why are you not talking? So please know that your voice is important and we want you to speak up and share where you feel it's appropriate. And with that, I'm gonna to toss it over to Patrice to tell you a little bit of background on how we got to where we are today to be talking about this story of being burned out as instructional designers and how that has evolved into compassion fatigue. Patrice? Thanks, Whitney. Sure, so this conversation initially emerged from a conference that I was at prior to the pandemic where we were talking about um, how learning designers were experiencing burnout and that a lot of it was coming from the fact that learning designers um, were essentially becoming what I was referring to as a Swiss army knife. You know, anytime a new task came up, whether it was coding, QA, project management, tech support, it seemed to always go to the, to the learning designer. And so there was a sense of being overwhelmed and you know, all, even then a sense that nobody really understood what it takes to do the work. And that it was like a magic switch where you know, um, a course or di digital learning asset appeared. So um, during the pandemic, Whitney and I were talking and as we were sharing stories, we noticed um, what was emerging was a sense of compassion fatigue. And we decided that we wanted to write a story that showed the trajectory of, you know, how um, the experiences from burnout to comp compassion fatigue were emerging. And just to give a sense of what we were all experiencing, I think we had this conversation in May and it was um, December by the time we finally finished writing the article. And in this article, we really saw three themes emerge. One was around caregiving, one was around invisible time, and one was around visibility. And the caregiving that we were hearing stories of was not, um, not only caregiving of family, whether it be um, parents or children, but caregiving of staff, students, and faculty. And so a lot of the stories were around how learning designers um, didn't realize the emotional weight of having to take on this, the feelings that the faculty member was having around being afraid and scared and overwhelmed and the taking on the emotions of the students and the experiences that they were having. And so they found that they were providing care for staff, peers, family, everyone. And the invisible time, again, goes back to that 24-7 work cycle that many of us were on, where people just didn't see that no one was taking vacation, people were just working nonstop because they had to, and because, again, they care and they didn't want to let anything fall through the cracks. And the other thing that we saw emerging was visibility. Suddenly, everyone knew that they had a teaching and learning center or a learning designer um, on, their, on their campus. And there was a lot of concern around, well, what's going to happen next? You know, will we be funded? People were leaving, their positions weren't being replaced because of budget cuts. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, um, both joy and trepidation around that newfound visibility. Um, and in some cases, you know, feelings of respect that people never had. And so just to uh, clarify between uh, two terms, I think a lot of people are familiar with burnout and that sense of um, just feeling overwhelmed, emotionally drained and exhausted, primarily due to excess of stress and, men and mental exhaustion. 
And the difference with compassion fatigue really is taking on the stress or trauma of others. And that's really where we saw the transition, uh, like I was saying, that people were taking on the trauma that the faculty members were experiencing. They were taking on the trauma that the students were experiencing. And so this was a whole different emotional weight that they were, that they were having to, to go through and figure out how to make sense of and deal with. And just kind of jumping in there, one of the things that I think I learned during the pandemic, having a, a child come home from Manhattan uh, on February 29th, right before the pandemic really hit, is there's an old saying that says a parent can only be as happy as their least happy child. And boy, did I learn that lesson during COVID. And I think I equate that learning, that lesson that I had to the role that an instructional designer has often taken on over the years. Uh, Pre-COVID, um, there were stories and experiences of learning designers being on the phone or on a Zoom call with a faculty member who could no longer move the mouse. And that individual stayed, that learning designer stayed on the line with that faculty member until he called an ambulance and was later taken to the hospital and diagnosed with with stage four brain cancer. Like there, there are stories of how instructional designers have been there for faculty and for students for such a long time, but it took the pandemic to push us to the point of compassion fatigue. And I think it was um, the young woman that I interviewed who was at an institution in New Orleans who said during Hurricane Katrina, there was this outpouring of care and support and other instructional designers that could actually help us but in this moment of COVID, everybody's sure sharing resources, but nobody has an ounce of energy left to help us in our time of need because it's everyone's time of need. And so that just kind of stuck with me thinking about all the different ways that learning designers, learning architects, instructional designers have been therapists all along. We've all been in that role and position. And I think we've spent a lot of time talking about trauma-informed pedagogy there's also this notion of trauma-informed learning design, and I, I think we'll continue to see a shift in how we think about the work that we do across the field. Um, that being said, now we want to take a little time to do a mindfulness activity. And as I mentioned, um, I, I learned a lot of these mindfulness uh, tips and tricks from, uh, from Leah. And um, because I'm not the expert, I have actually sought out a video that I'll share with you so that we can all spend a little time together being mindful. And you should be able to see my screen. I'm gonna start the video now and Dr. Weil is gonna take us through what's called the four, seven, eight breath exercise. famous 478 breath, the relaxing breath that I teach to all patients and doctors and students and friends, uh, another yoga breathing technique. Uh, in this, you try to keep your tongue in the yogic position, touching the tip of the tongue to the ridge of tissue just behind your upper front teeth, like that, and try to keep it there the whole time. You breathe in quietly through your nose to a count of four, and you hold your breath for a count of seven, and then blow air out forcefully through your mouth. <sighs> helps if you purse your lips out and you make a whoosh sound when you do that. So the exercise begins by letting all the air out through your mouth. Then you close your mouth, breathe in silently to a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven, out through your mouth audibly to a count of eight, and you repeat this for four breath cycles. Looks like this. <sighs>
that's it. Um, you. All right. I can actually feel myself getting more relaxed. Hopefully that was helpful to everyone. Um, I think one of the reasons we wanted to, to spend a little time doing that is because we're not very good at taking time to do things like that for ourselves. So it made a lot of sense to just center in the moment and hopefully warm you up for what will be our breakout group activity. Um, if you're familiar with liberating structures, Fantastic. This may seem familiar to you if you're not. Liberating Structures is a fantastic book filled with activities, but everything that is in the book is also open and available on their website, liberatingstructures.com. This is the Mad Tea Party. And what we're going to ask you to do in just a minute, Rachel's going to put you into your breakout rooms. We want you to take a moment to center yourself and share with each other who you are, what you do, but then what first inspired you to get into this work in online teaching and learning, blended teaching and learning. And let's break the ice with what is that courageous conversation that we're not having. And that should give us a lot of interesting directions that our um, future conversations can take together as a group. So we're introducing ourselves to each other in the group, talking about what inspired us, and then what is that courageous conversation. And Rachel, I believe, is ready to place everyone into breakout rooms. Any questions before we do so? I was just going to let people know that they'll have about 10 minutes, and Rachel will be putting you in a room of two or three people. Brilliant. I will go ahead and click some buttons and teleport you all to your, your groups. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Are we, are we gonna go into rooms? I did not click that button. They already know us, right? They need to get to know each other. And Rachel, looks like we have a few folks that didn't make it to a breakout room. Is that because they're on, but maybe not there to click to go? Some people, May also, we should have mentioned that if you don't, if people don't want to join in a breakout room, they can stay here in the main mm -hmm. lobby. I do see a few who haven't clicked their join button, so that may be the case. And then are you able to check in case anybody's in a room by themselves? Yeah, and I will move them around. And it does look like, oh, there's a large swath of people who are still muted, but they're just controlling that themselves. I see a bunch of people that are unmuted. <clears throat> and Rachel, out of curiosity, can they turn their cameras on? They can turn their cameras on. There's a, um, they just need to enable that in feed loop. Oh, okay. So if they're not in feed loop, if they're just on Zoom, will they not have that ability? Uh, they can do it in both platforms. Okay. Sorry, I'm just looking for the people who ended up. I see the number, the participant number here keeps going down. So people are. Yeah, I'm trying to, to port people over into spaces here where they'll have someone to talk to. Um. There's some really amazing people in this session. I was scrolling through and going, oh, I think I've heard of that person.
I think we've got everyone with someone else. So I'm still seeing 25 participants from my view. Is that right, Rachel? Yeah, that must yeah. be people who maybe don't want to go into a breakout. But everyone I haven't seen how to get in yet, actually. <laughs> oh, you're not able to get into a room? I don't see it. I'm on an iPad, though. Uh, Rachel could just put you in a room. Put me in a room. <laughs> All right, hang tight, Amy. I feel like I'm in trouble. I wondered if there were a whole bunch of people that were in this like limbo world that aren't making it to a breakout room. Yeah, I must be one of them. Thank you. Let's see. I'm really glad you spoke up. Thanks for letting us know. And there looks like there's somebody who just joined too, Rachel. So um, Gia, maybe Gia Donna. Yes, I'm Gia. Just set up breakout rooms a couple of minutes ago, where folks are introducing themselves to each other. And right now, getting you placed in a breakout room. Um, Sounds like you're having a lot of background noise, Giordana. Thank you. And Patrice, are you showing just two more minutes? I am, yes. Okay. I was just gonna ask if we should send out a, a two minute warning or? We can absolutely do that. Thank you, Rachel. Sure. So Patrice, since we have two minutes and it's been a little while, tell, remind me again, what got you inspired? Um, well, I mean, when I started teaching, I almost immediately started teaching online. Like that was, I was at Empire State College and they were just moving from like paper distance learning to online. And this was after I, your engineering degree? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think where it really culminated for me was when I was teaching internationally and um, we noticed that when we were in person with the students, they, it was great, right? Engaged, all the, what you would expect. And then when we went online, we lost them and, you know, they were in a very high touch culture. And so I think that the combination of like my technology background, I just started, and this was, you know, 15 years ago, I don't know, whatever, mm -hmm. um, 
trying to think about like how I used like Twitter and Facebook and Google Docs and things like that to connect with my peers and how might I use that in education. Now I should say I had no idea what FERPA was at that time or data security or privacy or you know what I mean accessibility like those things weren't like yet on the radar but that's definitely where it, like it emerged and in that program like we were one of the first people to use Zoom like when it very, very first, you know, came out, we were doing virtual sessions and things. Um, yeah, but I think also like my engineering background, like I just have a affinity for technology. Yeah, and wicked problems. You've wicked always been a solver. When I yeah. think back to like when we met, you were, yeah. you're a puzzle. Yes. Solver yeah. person, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to think about this the other day and, I have been thinking about my why, like, why do I do this in the first place? Because I think it brings me to a place of being happy mm -hmm. that I get the opportunity to do this work, right? Yeah. So my first experience with online learning was not online at all. I was studying to be a K-12 teacher and it was in 1998 or 99. I can't remember which year. Um, and we were all in a classroom where the computers were down in the desk. You know how they used to have those desks where the computer was like embedded in it and there was yeah. a keyboard there, but you were looking down at this monitor. And I remember sitting in the classroom with all these other young women, most K-12 educators in elementary ed are. And we started off having a conversation and the teacher walked in and he explained that for this particular course that we were going to be using a new technology, WebCT. And so we all logged into the class and the classroom got completely silent. Mm -hmm. And we all jumped into the discussion forums and started to talk to each other, but via text, right? Like it, that whole room got super quiet, yeah. but we were having such rich conversations and maybe even conversations we wouldn't have had if we had had to verbalize what we were saying. Yeah. And there was a moment for me where I was like, this is really interesting, right? Yeah. So before I finished my undergrad in teaching, I took a class, a master's degree class in educational technology, and it, I was already hooked. I was just completely mesmerized by it. So, um, oh, Rachel, is it time? You, Patrice, are you guys all set to bring folks yeah. back? I, yeah. I gave you yeah. a warning to wrap their conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we should bring them all back. Right. We will close all the rooms and people will port back now. Perfect. And Rachel, when we've got everybody back, if you can let Patrice know, she's going to lead our debrief. Perfect. I've got about uh, 45 seconds here. Hang tight. Yeah, I see the numbers climbing. <laughs> If you're just coming back, welcome back. I see the numbers ticking up in the main room. It's always interesting when people come back to the main Zoom room, they're typically our cameras on. <laughs> we haven't seen you. And, yeah. uh, but in small groups, cameras tend to come on and we get really collaborative and social. And so thanks for, thanks for coming back with your camera on. It's nice to see some friendly faces. Yes, yes. Um. And we'll just give it uh, just a couple more seconds here. We should have everyone okay. back. Okay. I know there's always that sense when you're in the breakout and it says you'll, you'll automatically be returned in 60 seconds and you're kind of like, do I sit here and wait 60 seconds? Do I just like go Click back? The <laughs> is that like awkward? <laughs> All right, Patrice, the floor is yours. Okay, great, thank you. So we hope that, um, Everyone had a good time in their breakout rooms and that you met some new people and maybe, you know, started to develop some new relationships. And hopefully we broke up a conversation because that's a sign of a good conversation. And what we would love for you to do right now is share any takeaways in the chat. And so if you would like, um, it, We'd love, we would especially love to hear about the conversations that we are not having. And so if everyone wants to take a minute to either share a brief highlight of that or just something that really stuck with you from the conversation you had in your breakout room. And I love me some wait time, but it looks like Shelly had shared in the chat that there were lots of similarities around the table about 
courageous conversations that need to be had. So maybe Shelly wants to just open her mic and share, please. Oh, wow, Whitney put me on the spot. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, I, I, well, I think a couple of the people that were in the room with me could probably do this better justice. I hope that, please chime in if, if I don't. But I think the thing that stood out was the similarities about um, courageous conversations we need to have about not going back to the way things were, embracing mm -hmm. the new normal and maybe exploring more alternatives. We, all of us were feeling a lot of just kind of go back to the same old, same old and not learn from all the exciting stuff that did mm -hmm. come from um, the positive things that came from the um, pandemic. I think the other thing was we, we talked about that in terms of teaching, compassion and flexibility and all of those things have been embraced and even hybrid and online options, but most institutions aren't apply, uh, applying that to their employees, especially instructional, instructional designers. And so they're, they're seeing that faculty and students are getting a lot of those considerations and the employees are treated come back five days a week, no flexible options, no hybrid options, no remote options. And that, that hasn't gone over so well in terms of motivation, mm -hmm. et cetera. All right, well, thank you. And um, please feel free to keep sharing in the chat um, anything that comes to mind. And after that warm up, um, what we're going to do next is spend some time doing some silent reflection in a Google Doc. And so um, a methodology, methodology that Whitney and I have been using in some of our workshops um, is giving people just about 10 minutes of quiet reflection time to reflect on some questions related to burnout and compassion fatigue. And we think this is really important as a way to anonymously give everyone an opportunity to share their thoughts and ideas and have a voice in the conversation. And just as a reminder, um, this is an open document. It is open to the public, um, but nobody can see your name unless you, unless you put it there. Um, so what we're going to do, um, I believe Rachel will share the link to the Google Doc in the chat. And then we'll take about 10 minutes to give people time to think about those questions. And then we'll come back and have a conversation. And hopefully people will have cameras on and microphones on. Um, and we'll come back and share. And so for this exercise, we'll all be in the main room, but you'll be working in the Google Doc. And if anyone has any questions, um, you can either put it in the chat or just turn your microphone on and ask. And it looks like Rachel has shared the link to the Google Doc in the chat. I can see that in Zoom and mm -hmm. she may have already shared it in Feedloop as well. Is that right, Rachel? That is correct. It's over in either chat function, whichever you choose. Oh, is that the wrong? Oh, hang on. Uh, Rachel, that may be the wrong link, it says. <laughs> oh boy, okay. Um, let's see. I have, yeah, I, I, I got it. Okay. Thank you, Patrice. You have to log all the way out of Google in order to respond anonymously. Oh, thank you for mentioning that, Callie. I was not aware that that was the case. I'm, I'm one, well, it's, it's a question. I'm wondering. I don't think so. I um, get you do right now. Do. Like all I see right now are like anonymous tiger, anonymous hippo. Okay, so you don't see my name when it next to this one that says hi. Does it say my name? Let me see, Kelly. Um, are no, you on my screen? It says, it says um, anonymous hippo. Perfect. Yeah. I'm a hippo. <laughs> <laughs> You may want to get out and get back in if you actually want to be anonymous. I don't. I don't. Oh, well, yeah. Whitney, yours says your name. Yeah, that's because if you own it on the doc. Yeah. yeah, we promise we won't share. <laughs> I'll tell you anything all day long verbally, though. You know me. Yeah, I don't. I don't care either. <laughs> Whitney and Patrice, I put the other doc or link to the doc over in Feedloop. So everyone should have that too. 
Perfect. I apologize. I, I think we've got a link mix up in our coordination document. So that's an issue on our end. Apologies. Not a problem. It happens. It's the quick recovery that is always appreciated. <laughs> You know, they say if you go to Disney and you have a bad experience, all the folks there are like able to come and fix it for you, right? Like if your child drops their ice cream, then somebody who works on the Disney cast will swoop in and <laughs> offer your child a trip into one of the gift shops to get them a stuffed Mickey Mouse or something, right? And um, it's that recovery that causes people to come back to the park. You can have a great experience and you're like 50% more likely to go back to the park or 50% likely to go back to the park. But if there's this beautiful recovery from this weird moment, this moment that could have been disastrous, that you're like 77% more likely to go back to the park. So I hear you. And I think as learning designers, I try to rem remind my team of that every now and then. I'm like, it's okay. Things are going to go wrong. It's how you recover, right? It's like watching a play on stage where the actor slips or says the wrong word and then it's how they recover and you don't even notice there was a mistake, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Document looks excellent. So we have about 10 minutes left in the session and we thought we would use the last 10 minutes to um, share a little bit about some of the themes that emerged in the document or if anyone wants to turn their microphone on and share some thoughts that they have and then we will um, return to the outcomes for this session and just talk about one small next step that we want everyone to take. Um, so Whitney, were there any themes or things that jumped out at you that you wanted to share to kind of kick us off? Sure. So, um, I saw a lot of statements of emotion and it's hard. We, uh, Patrice and I have, have led a similar session in other settings before, and it's hard for us to read through these comments and not feel, feel for each person that is sharing. So thank you for your candid. Um, thank you for sharing your candid stories with us. Um, it's a lot. And we know it's been hard for so many people. Um, I see a lot of personal burnout. I see a lot of professional burnout. Um, I also see a story of where joy can come from somewhere else. Um, there's an Adam Grant video in there. So as I think about that, I'm reminded of a conversation I had before lunch today. <laughs> so just a little bit earlier today, I had my second conversation with a friend and colleague who called me stressed and burned out from the work that she's doing because of COVID. And we talked about what she really found joy in, and that was evaluation. So still tangential to learning design. And since we spoke last, there's an opportunity that is going to open up at her institution that's NSF grant funded and has great potential to be the next big adventure for her and also allow her to limit the scope of the things that she has to do. And one of the things that I saw in the Google Doc was, um, do faculty really know what we do? Faculty do know what an instructional designer is, but I think if you ask them all, they wouldn't necessarily be able to define it. And that's because I think in the intentional futures report that came out in like 2016, it said an instructional designer does like 17 different full-time jobs, right? So it's the, the, the work is so varied and vast. Um, so just something as simple as her finding that niche thing that she can do now to narrow the scope and really focus in on something that gives her life meaning and purpose is allowing her to kind of reboot, if you will, what her career pathway looks like. So just a, a moment I'll share. 
Thank you. Yeah, and I think two things that um, stuck out for me, uh, one was somebody referred to it as scar tissue and that it just never really, it never really leaves, uh, which I think is a lot of what we're experiencing. And I appreciated the, the, the um, with some discussion about humanizing learning design and not forgetting that we too are humans. And I've heard stories um, from learning designers where they feel almost like the fixer. Like it seems like whatever the issue is, you know, the learning designer has become the person that whomever it is comes running to as, you know, you need to be able to fix it and fix it now, no matter what day or time, no matter what day or time it is. Um, and we would love to hear from anyone who wants to turn on their microphone if in camera, if so inclined, to either share themes, takeaways, thoughts, solutions. Yeah, go ahead. Ken. I'll, I'll, I'll speak up. I was going to type it, but um, Simon said that he likes the scar tissue comparison. And I would say what I was typing was that I do as well, because I have some massive scar tissue in my back from a, an old injury and I'll just be going along fine. Everything's fine. You know, doing all my exercise, doing my yoga, running, like everything's great. And I'll take one misstep and it will fire and I will not be able to walk. I'll be walking like a 90 year old, you know, lady because my back, that scar tissue gets inflamed and just fires up. I think that burnout is also kind of like that. It's not necessarily, or maybe it's the languishing that, that Adam Grant talks about that's like that, where, you know, things will be going fine and I'm going along okay, just getting the work done and, you know, like it sucks, there's so much of it, but whatever, get it done, let it go at the end of the day. And then something triggers and it's just like, ooh, that stress bubbles over. So I think because there's not, there's no consistency right now in any part of any of our lives, that that makes it, that makes it really challenging, or at least it's been really challenging for me. And that scar tissue is a great comparison I'd never thought of before. So who knows, whoever said that. Yeah. I Another thing that I saw some sharing of in the document, and now I was thinking about with respect to your comment on triggering is, and I've heard this story from like a number of colleagues that um, we were being asked to come back to the office, but then we're sitting in our office on Zoom and that we're not collaborating with anyone when we're in the office. And it's, it's creating like additional stress for people. Um, it's like you're coming back to your office, almost like expecting something that is not there. And for many people, it's almost worse in coming into an office where you can't collaborate and you're sitting alone on Zoom than, um, you know, the flexibility of being at home. And also, you know, there's more of a sense of the expectation that you might be on Zoom at home. But I was also wondering, you know, when you said that, Callie, if like also just going back to the office is triggering to some people, like if they were experiencing burnout and a lot of stress before and they've almost found some, you know, flexibility and maybe a little bit more, um, you know, man time, you know, able to manage their time a little bit differently, that maybe coming back to the office is also triggering of some of those feelings. I, I, I have a theory. I wonder if it doesn't reintroduce a gender power dynamic or mm. something that doesn't exist in Zoom where everybody's two-dimensional, but mm -hmm. exists when you're in the same space with them. And I, I don't know what it is yet. I just, I think there's something there. But I've also been the only woman around the table in the room for a long time, so <laughs> carrying that one around with me, obviously. <laughs> Would anyone else like to share? Yeah, just want to add that I think that a lot of it is this 
being told to quote like get back to normal or get back to work and i find those comments just insidious what do you think we've been doing since march 2020 what do you think has been going on and if you're my supervisor you should know i've been working you should know that i'm i've been busy and i've been giving you everything that you're asking you know while potentially kids at home or um like for me personally i had I, like many people several deaths in the family and and friends and it's like what do you think has been going on since then and now you're telling me is if we've been on vacation this is not a vacation um and i think that every single thing hits me with like acidity as opposed to the compassion that we all really want and thought working in higher ed would kind of give us, at least for me. What has the place, Bren, to your point, what has the physicality of the place meant versus the physicality of, of not being there? Like, has it changed the work? Has it changed the process? I'm, and I can only speak for myself, but nothing about what I did changed, um, you know, in, in terms of the work that needed to be done. Um, a little bit more increased reporting, um, people needing more information. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, like I personally, I had a very long commute. Um, and and um, to be able to have that relief of not that commute where fighting with, you know, bad traffic every day, to get into a, a place where, you know, public restrooms in, during a pandemic, where if you're out and about in hallways, you have to, you know, mask up. Um, you can't have meetings in person. What's the point of me coming into the office to fight for traffic, fight with traffic for an hour, to then have meetings on my computer, to do work on my computer with my office door closed, to use public restrooms where who knows who has been coughing all over the place, and just drive an hour plus home to get home to kids who are telling me, oh, well, I was close contact, so now I'm on quarantine. Like, there's just, there are so many levels, but it's like, the work-wise, nothing really changed except for the collaborations now, it just increased um, who was on the computer mm -hmm. as opposed to who was in person. And nobody wants to meet in person because, of course, everybody's afraid. And I don't blame anybody. I am, too. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much for sharing that. And um, I think we're just getting to the point where we're opening up and sharing stories that I think are really, really powerful. And I absolutely hate that we're running short on time. But, um, Patrice, do you want to run us through just the things that we hoped we'd get to talk about today and maybe how we can continue the conversation? Sure, and I know that we're right at the end of our session, but we did want to go um, just back to in leaving this session. We hope that you are better able to understand the elements of compassion fatigue and burnout um, and are able to think about some of the factors that support or hinder work-life balance. And what we would really love for you is to reflect on how some of these findings might help you um, with your experiences with burnout and compassion fatigue. And to continue sharing in the document and on social media. Um, and also please reach out to both Whitney and I um, if there's anything else that you would like to share or talk about. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being so open and being a part of this conversation today. It's an important conversation to have. And as leaders in this space, it's important for you to have these conversations with your teams and think about how you can advocate for others. So thank you again, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney and Patrice. What a wonderful session. So, And thank you, everyone, for all your, your thoughtful and reflective remarks today. Please uh, continue to engage on the conference platform, connect with each other, continue to utilize that Google Doc and share. Um, and we appreciate your time. Thank you again to our speakers, um, and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all.